The other thing I want to say at the beginning is that you all see me on the screen now, but this event would not would have not been possible without a team working on it. So let me thank Nuno da Silva Marques, Anya Moon Reiser, Andreas Ross, Sophia Johnson, and Mia Yulka for their help and everyone else who has been helping us with everything that was needed at the division. So before introducing our guest, and I am extremely proud and happy to have Professor Rob Nixon with us today, let me say a few words about the Environmental Humanities Laboratory and this event. But I promise that I will not talk for more than eight minutes, believe me. And after uh, that, Rob will talk for about 45, 50 minutes, and then we will open the floor for the Q&A session. So the Environmental Humanities Lab is based at the Division of History of Science, Technology and the Environment at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. The lab was created in 2011, and since then, it has been a space for knowledge experiments and robust public engagement. We have defined our space as an undisciplined space, meaning with it a gesture towards a radical critique of the mainstream production of academic knowledge. I can share here the very exciting news that since September, the lab has become an official center for the KTH Royal Institute of Technology, a great achievement because it implies that the entire university is deeply committed to supporting our work. Since 2012, the Stockholm Archipelago Lecture opens the lab's yearly activities, and we have been very lucky to have among our guests Am Amitav Ghosh, Laura Pulido, Nancy Fraser, Ashil Bembe, and today Professor Nixon, just to mention a few of them, but you can find all the series online on our website. Of course, I don't know what will be the main contents of Professor Nixon talk so today so no spoiler on me I, I don't know uh, the details but however the title and the abstract suggest that Rob will talk about altruistic connections in the web of life preparing for today I was thinking how I could embrace this idea in my short presentation then I decided I should talk about the network the many connections that allow us to be as the lab uh, to be what we are actually to be better than we are I think the lab is connected through a multiple ties to many places better off to many people around the world in the gloomy language of the neoliberal academia we would call them networks and partnership with stakeholders but the truth the truth is that those ties are made of stories memories love care common struggle intellectual debts that aptly become affection as for instance with me and professor nixon intellectual affect intellectual debts that become affection it is not that the environmental humanities lab is connected to a network actually i think i would say that the the environmental humanities laboratory lives through those links it becomes what it is because of those links Asked about his identity, the subcomandante Marcos, the leader of the Zapatista insurgency, uh, used to answer that basically uh, Marcos was everyone who was oppressed. He made a fantastic, even poetic speech that I don't have the time to quote here because it's long, but I really urge you to look up on internet who is Marcos because it's really beautiful, very moving. So the first few years I moved to Stockholm when we were just establishing the lab, often people asked me where the lab actually were. At that time, we, we did not have a room. Sometimes I was a qu quite despondent, upset, sad about this. Now, now I would say proudly that the lab is in Rio, in Moro da Babilonia, in Florianopolis, where migration history meets, meets environmental history, in Bahia, where our friends side with indigenous people regardless of everything. The lab is in Naples at the School for Climate Activists in Tuzla with the Workers' University in Granada with our friends trying to decolonize the university. I could go ahead for too long, but this is not an imperialist project. The lab has not expanded. Uh, it is not a brand. The lab is a small, I could even say a tiny institution, no logo to export. Precisely the reverse, the lab today is not 
is not what we were planning because of these connections of connection channels that brought us many much life and lead us to places that we we, we didn't even dreamed of so where is the lab the lab is now today the lab is in stockholm and in many places around the world striving to build another world while living it every day perhaps gardening the rhizomatic connections that make us better than we could ever hope to be professor rob nixon is one of those connections for many of us for me for sure rob's work has been a source of inspiration he has made us see things that we couldn't see before of course i'm talking here about Rob's contribution to our collective reflection on environmental justice through his concept of slow violence. By slow violence, and I am now reading from Rob's uh, book, Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor, by slow violence, I mean a violence that occurs gradually and out of sight, a violence of delayed destruction that is dispersed across time and space, an attritional violence that is typically not viewed as violence at all. End quote. In another very influential essay, Rob, Rob Nixon came out with a short line that then became a powerful phrase for many of us who wish to think critically of the Anthropocene. I am now quoting this short phrase. We may live all, sorry, we might all be in the Anthropocene, but we are not, uh, uh, but we are not all in the same way. No, we are not in it all in the same way. What a powerful sentence, isn't it? I could continue, but I must now give the floor to Rob. So allow me to close with a proper introduction of our guest. Rob Nixon is Baron Family Professor in the Humanities and the Environment at Princeton University. Before joining Princeton in 2015, uh, Professor Nixon held a Rachel Carson professorship. Yes. I must shut up. Yes, I will. Uh, Rachel Carson, uh, professorship in English at the University of Wisconsin Madison, is the author of four books London Calling, VS Naipaul, Postcolonial Mandarin, Homelands, Harlem and Hollywood, South African Culture and the World Beyond, Dream Birds, The Natural History of Fantasy, and Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor, which won four prizes. Nixon is frequent is a frequent contributor to the New York Times. His writing has also appeared in the New Yorker, Atlantic Monthly, The Guardian, The Nation, Times Literary Supplement, and many other uh, venues. In his profile, we can read that Rob and I am quoting here, is excited about the transformative energy now evident in the environmental humanities as collectively we think beyond restrictive borders and narrow disciplinary mandates. So, well, what else should I add? Please join me in welcoming a truly champion of the environmental humanities, Professor Rob Nixon. Rob, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Marco. It's uh, great to be back, if not in person, uh, back at KTH, which is uh, one of the great engine rooms of uh, the environmental humanities and environmental justice work uh, globally. So thank you for this invitation and thank you to the team um, for, for making this happen. Um, I'm particularly honored and delighted to be giving the Archipelago Lecture. Uh, both because it's a very distinguished series and also because, as you as you may see in my talk today, there are little conceptual islands uh, that I will alight on and hopefully they cohere into an archipelago, but that's not for me to judge. Um, so a simple question animates my talk today. Why at this particular point in history have millions of readers and viewers become magnetized by the once obscure field of plant communication. In the last decade and a half or so, a vast literature that interprets plant communication, uh, botanical research into forest sentience, forest suffering, uh, uh, and plant communication, this, this vast body of literature has found popular audiences uh, for the first time. So why the sudden surge of interest? Uh, one uh, explanation might be that uh, our forests globally are suffering. Uh, we're losing um, uh, uh, forests approximately the size uh, equivalent of uh, Portugal each year. Um, but it's not clear that a, uh, an awareness of metaphoric forest suffering should lead us to 
be fascinated by the literally suffering forest. In other words, the capacity of forests to, for instance, uh, feel pain. Uh, nor does an awareness of forest decline require a belief that uh, trees have the ability to convey their distress to their neighboring trees. So the question that I'm asking today is, could it be that writers, filmmakers, readers, viewers are turning en masse to the idea of the social forest for consolation and illumination? What if the forest offers ways of reimagining the balance between self-interest and cooperative flourishing, which in most human society is badly out of joint? Could the current appeal of cooperative forest science exemplify what indigenous botanist Robin uh, Wall Kimmerer describes as humans seeking guidance from older other species? For the contemporary science of plant communication reveals hidden botanical networks of what anthropologist Anat Singh calls, quote, collaborative survival, unquote. But the question remains, why this interest now? How precisely does the su science of suffering, of the suffering healing cooperative forest, suggest alternative systems of being there at the crossroads where human and more than human communities meet and mingle. Well, let me just get my uh, uh, screen share up. Sorry. Hold on. I'm just struggling to get this uh, shared. That's not working. Sorry, is it possible to? Um, Rob, yeah. Rob. If you if you wish, we can also operate the PowerPoint from here. I can once, once I've got it going, I can operate it. I'm just sorry. I just uh, sure, sure, no uh, problem. Is that is that visible? No. No. Uh, sorry, let me get this up first. Okay, now I can do it. Now. Yes. Yep, great. Okay. Perfect. Right. Sorry about that. So Robin Kimmerer, as I suggested, is one of the key thinkers in this turn. Um, her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants, has been on the New York Times bestseller list uh, in the top 10 for 129 weeks. It was published by a very small press, but over the last uh, nine or 10 years since it appeared, it has become uh, this hit bestseller. Uh, and one of the things that, that Kimmerer argues in this book is that um, indigenous knowledge systems very often took into account um, cooperative uh, dynamics among um, different uh, species. And one of the examples that she gives in the book is of so-called masting, uh, where trees produce nuts or acorns uh, simultaneously across vast geographical regions. So for instance, the example of, of pecan trees, 
um, in the United States, um, all the way from the south to the northeast, um, the trees will simultaneously in certain years produce enormous numbers of nuts. And the idea is that the, the nuts flood um, the, the, the world with food. And so uh, predators uh, cannot consume all those nuts. And so the individual nuts have a better chance of surviving um, if you have the synchronized um, masting. Uh, that, as she um, explains, uh, cannot cannot be simply explained away by um, the proximity because of the the great geographical distances and the variable climate across which this happens. And so she she argues that indigenous uh, communities have long understood that there must be some mechanism for uh, plant to tree to tree communication. A second uh, major figure in in this. Uh, movement towards uh, the public engagement with forest science uh, is Suzanne Simard, a professor of forest ecology at University of British Columbia in Canada. Um, and her TED talk, How Trees Talk to Each Other, uh, has amassed over 200, 2 million views. Uh, and Suzanne Simard uh, worked for the Canadian Forest uh, Service for, for many years. And um, in mixed forests, where they had prized um, uh, Douglas fir and so-called junk trees like paper birch, they decided to improve the the expand the Lebens realm of the of the uh, Douglas fir by removing the paper birch, and the expectation was that given more room, given more resources, um, that the the firs would flourish. And in fact, many of them went into decline. Uh, so the opposite of what was expected. Um, and so one of the things that, that uh, Simard and her team's uh, research uh, concluded was that actually there were underground exchanges going on uh, between trees of these different species that have different uh, sort of plant equivalents of immune systems. And they were trading nutrients resources, genetic materials uh, across species lines. And one of, from a public science perspective or environmental humanities perspective, one of um, some odd great contributions was coining the term the wood wide web. Uh, and, uh, and Marco talked at the beginning of, of, of networks. Um, and this is a very particular kind of network whereby um, um, mycorrhizal networks um, hundreds of miles of fungi beneath a single footstep uh, are, are communicating and maintaining the forest collective health. So the Wood Wide Web's uh, great corridors of being allow robust older trees to steer sugars towards vulnerable saplings or to, towards their suffering neighbors. Um, conversely, dying trees can send their residual resources back into the network to help healthy trees, increasing the latter's chances of survival. Uh, moreover, these underground uh, mycorrhizal networks help brace trees in a storm and enable them to share water and nutrients. Um, one tree may transmit chemical and electrical signals through the mycorrhizal network to um, alert adjacent trees of impending threats. This was something that I inadvertently noticed when I was a kid growing up in South Africa. I was very interested in um, the outdoors. And I just happened to grow up in an area where there were a lot of giraffe, um, uh, maybe like moose in parts of Sweden. Um, and I noticed that giraffe loved to fe uh, feed on acacia trees. And that they would move to a clump of acacia trees and, and take a few bites and then jump back. And then instead of continuing to eat where they are, they would move to the next clump of trees. I didn't understand this, but I thought it was um, irrational behavior on the part of the giraffes. We now know that um, through chemical, chemical signaling, when a acacia is, is bitten by a predator like a giraffe, uh, it will that that tree will emit chemical signals that get transmitted through the mycorrhizal network to the adjoining acacia trees. They also then 
uh, are on alert and, and send out this chemical signal, which makes the leaves distasteful. Now they they don't keep the chemical signal on all the time because it is not uh, it, it it would um, use energy, um, and so by having a kind of a, a, a community watch, if you want to call it that, um, there's a there's this uh, an element of 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 communication through this this uh, this this um, uh, electrical signals. So. So Simard and, and, and Kimra are very key figures in what I'm talking about today. Um, but they're just part of a larger literature um, of the last few years. Some of you may know uh, Richard Powers, uh, The Overstory, a, a, a book, a vast transnational book and prize winning book about in which trees are essentially the central characters. And uh, he has a key um, character there called uh, Dr. Pat, uh, Pat Westerford, who is loosely modeled on Suzanne Simard, the Canadian ecologist I just talked about. Um, and in the novel, um, she does this research in the 1970s that shows that biochemical signals, like the one I just talked about with the giraffe and the acacia, that biochemical signals um, were um, being used by maple trees to alert um neighboring trees of the the presence of predators or invaders uh she she was uh, ridiculed at the time by the male uh, science establishment um and she went into exile didn't get an academic job but later science like the kind that samad and and kim are involved in uh vindicated her and she then um uh, became uh famous writing a book, a nonfiction book called The Secret Forest. Okay, so The Secret Forest as a nonfiction book is embedded in this um, very uh, famous uh, work by Richard Powers, his fiction. Uh, many of you have probably also heard of, of Peter Wollherben, uh, a German forester uh, who wrote The Hidden Life of Trees. And um, it's a book that's been translated, I believe, into 32 languages, another huge uh, New York Times bestseller, um, um, uh, drawing in part on, on Simard's work, but also his own practice as a, as a forester and a critique, uh, uh, yeah, uh, as somebody who critiques industrial uh, forestry practices. Uh, Robert McFarlane also writes about this in Underland, um, his look at uh, what lies beneath, including mycorrhizal networks. And one of the characters in McFarlane's book, best-selling book, is Merlin Sheldrake, a, who writes, uh, has written Entangled Life, another international bestseller. Uh, on, he's a, he, he specializes, he's a scientist of fungal networks. So there, I could go on. There are, um, Peter, uh, in addition to these books, we have Colin Tudge's The Secret Life of Trees, David Haskell's Songs of Trees, The Stories of Nature's Great Connectors. Eduardo Cohen uh, has written one of the most influential uh, social science books in recent times. He's an anthropologist of Ecuador, uh, How Forests Think. And so at a certain point, all these, these titles start to blur. We have the secret network of nature, the secret life of plants, what a plant knows, thus spoke the plant, the language of plants, brilliant green, the surprising history and science of plant intelligence. Uh, can you hear the trees talking and discovering the hidden life of the forest? That's just a small sample. So in trying to figure out why there has been the surge of interest in a science that has been around quite a long time, I wanted to think a little bit about uh, how, we, how we could position this um, thinking in relation to neoliberalism. In 1987, Margaret Thatcher uh, famously or notoriously declared, there is no such thing as society. There are only individual men and women, and there are families. At the same time, Ronald Reagan said the nine most frightening words in the English language are, I'm from the government and we're here to help. Um, so uh, less than a year later, in, 1990, uh, in 1988, 
James Hansen, the director of the NASA Goddard, Goddard Institute, delivered a historical address uh, to the US Congress calling for collective action to avert climate change. This is in 1988. Hansen testified that climate science was 99% unequivocal. The world was indeed warming. We need to act collaboratively to reduce emissions, he said. But Hansen's call to humanity to tackle the climate crisis with collective resolution collided with the political ascendancy of neoliberalism, an ideology hostile to the very idea of society, let alone participatory democracy. Neoliberalism, neoliberals promoted a culture of hyper-individualism and hyper-conflation that conflated freedom with atomized consumer choice. Government was condemned as freedom's adversary, and the idea of the public good receded in favor of individual consumer goods. So as a result, um, thinking of Thatcher and Reagan on the one hand and James Hansen on the other, as a result, you have a clash between a scaled up climate crisis that demanded urgent collaborative action and a scaled down commitment to the social collective. So in society after society, rulers have embraced a compromised democracy that cultivates exclusion, widening the circles of disenfranchisement. Autocracy and plutocracy blend and fuse. People find themselves, many people find themselves both globalized and atomized, abandoned to conditions of compound vulnerability. Many of those abandoned crave an alternative to government by the few for the few, an alternative to mega mergers for the wealthy and community fracture for the rest. The successful have effectively seceded, leaving in their wake disguised democracies that are shadows of what democracy should be. We think of Bolsonaro's Brazil, Hungary, Indonesia, the Philippines, South Africa, Russia, Turkey, uh, the UK, the US, and many others. All of which, uh, in all of which, the, the divide between democratic and plutocratic rule has become disturbingly thin. Leaders declare war on participatory democracy slash voter rolls, hack elections, intimidate voters, and stoke moral panics on social media. The powerful harass, imprison, torture, and even murder nonviolent protesters, journalists, and classes of humanity deemed disposable. Meanwhile, surveillance capitalism herds people into siloed online communities where they become complicit in their own policing. Quinn Slobodian observes that from the outset, the neoliberal project perceived democracy as a threat to be contained. Crucially, during the decolonizing world of the 1970s, when uh, Thatcherism and the, the precursors of Thatcherism and Reaganism were emerging, neoliberalism sought to fortify transnational institutions that would curtail sovereignty among decolonizing nations. This is a model of what uh, Jan Werner Müller has dubbed constrained democracy. So today, um, fearful multitudes abandoned to market efficiencies have swung to the left and swung to the right. Some seek redemption in so-called strongmen. Others pursue a politics that acknowledges government obligations to protect the most vulnerable among us from climate breakdown, pandemics, homelessness, and preventable destitution. In this context, so the, the attempt, the contemporary fascination with a cooperative forest makes increasing sense in which the forest serves as a loose allegory uh, uh, for an image of and an, an, an a model of shared survival. After the 2007, 2008 uh, global financial crash, the appeal to the collaborative forest life as allegory took a particular urgent turn. For the crash intensified challenges to economic, uh, neoliberal economic orthodoxy. Even politicians who had ignored the inequality crisis could do so no longer. The 1% became a meme. How could an economic ideology that branded itself as 
rational have delivered such dangerously destabilizing unequal growth. After the crash, billions who felt that achieved a toehold of security saw their prospects disintegrate. Given neoliberalism's hostility to safety nets, if you slipped, you didn't fall, you plummeted. The COVID-19 pandemic reprised that experience of ordinary people discovering that daily life had given way to new levels of vulnerability and structural abandonment. In the years following the financial crash, we've seen a preoccupation with this question. How do we fix growth that is socially destabilizing and ecologically ruinous? Populist uprising protesting inequality and climate breakdown have grown in frequency and intensity. Since the 2008 crash, we have seen heightened efforts to rethink relations between self-interest and shared flourishing. It is surely no coincidence that during this period, we have witnessed a public outpouring of writing about the collaborative dynamics of forest life. For the science of the wood wide web speaks to a widespread yearning for systemic changes that reduce social abandonment and allow more people to achieve the dignity of being and recognition. The forest networks that Simard and Kimmerer's research illuminate can thus be read as a counter to what uh, the anthropologist Julie Livingston calls self-devouring growth. So Friedrich, uh, Friedrich Hayek, uh, the uh, famous Austrian economist and a foundational figure in neoliberal thought, argued that the mind of the market made competition the principal doctrine for organizing human life. Lauren Sommer, a former uh, chief economist of the World Bank, uh, has praised Hayek's idea of the price system as a kind of mind calling it, quote, the most penetrating and original idea um, microeconomics produced in the 20th century, unquote. The idea of the market mind, Summons, Summers argues, is, quote, um, the single most important thing you can learn from an economic course today, unquote. For Hayek, Summers, and their followers, no human mind could approximate the omniscient authority of the market's price system. But from the perspective of the disenfranchised, what happens when the mind of the market makes no rational sense? Where can people find more inclusive, more cooperative uh, visions, uh, ways of being to counter winner-takes-all competition? If Hayek's disciples conflate the entire human value system with market-driven price, in other words, if, if price is become synonymous with worth, what place is there for values like compassion and empathy, justice, equity, cooperation? Some scientific proponents of forest intelligence maintain that the forest has a mind of its own. But as blueprints for being, the market and the forest at, as metaphorical mega minds offer radically divergent pathways. Uh, plant physiologist uh, Stefano Mancuso believes that our brain fixated assumptions about what constitutes intelligence have biased us against the kinds of cognition, learning, pain, perception, and communication uh, that the plant world often exhibits. Biological intelligence, Mancuso maintains is quote, unquote, simply the ability to solve problems. And such problem solving is not typically conducted in isolation as the KTH lab exhibits. Um, Mancuso's research suggests that a plant may boast a repertoire or vocabulary of as many as 3000 different chemical signals uh, vital to its interactive power um, 
Building on Simard's Wood Wide Web, Mancuso argues that an interconnected forest possesses a vast networked brain surrogate without a brain. Um, so the point is not to insist that plants are brainier than we thought, um, but that human intelligence and plant intelligence are essentially incomparable. Um, Mancuso founded the Society for Plant Neurobiology, uh, co-founded that. Uh, it became controversial uh, because they said, well, how can you have neurobiology if you don't have neurons and so forth? So uh, they renamed the society, the Society for Plant Signaling and Behavior. Okay. Um, but the point they were making uh, was, was the same, which is that um, a forest can be both brainless and super smart. Um, in this way, Mancuso and his allies seek to sidestep the, the charge of sentimental anthropomorphism. Uh, so in much of, uh, much of Western thought, humans um, are elevated above other species, whereas plants are exiled to evolution's lower rungs. Uh, plants in this view are dumb, they're mute. Uh, incapable of, of intelligence, and they're burdened by a primitive immobility. Um, so we, when we see uh, a, a threat coming, we're able to run away or get in our cars and escape. Plants are stuck in place. However, um, plants have failed to develop specialist organs. You don't have a, uh, they don't have a heart or a liver or a brain or lungs. Uh, and so while they're incapable of fleeing, they can survive levels of predation that a human uh, that would obliterate a human uh, because a tree has no unique irreplaceable organs. It is more leeway for self regeneration. Uh, sometimes even if insects have consumed 90% of the plant, that plant can regenerate. Um, if one of our predators uh, eats our brain or our heart or our lungs. We're basically screwed. Okay, um, so these are different models of uh, evolutionary intelligence, and so in the decentralized morphologies, uh, Mancuso and others argue, plants compared to humans have a have a different kind of evolutionary intelligence. Um, Hayek saw the omniscient mind of the market as driving competition forward. Much of the new writing about forest networks deploys a similar language, but points in the opposite direction. The German forester Volleben portrays the forest as a superorganism that constitutes a kind of, in his words, mind. Suzanne Simard speaks of collective, quote unquote, forest wisdom, a distributed intelligence that operates as if the constitutive plants in the forest uh, comprised a single organism. Okay. Neoliberal economics and cooperative biology thus converge on the same metaphor, but as blueprints for being, the mind of the market and the mind of the forest take us down different paths. So at the heart of this work on the Wood Wide Web, um, stands a paradox, what we, we might call the paradox of self-interested altruism. Um, this idea of altruism, as, as we, we look at uh, within the relationship between the birch trees and the Douglas firs in some of our uh, Canadian research, uh, this altruism can transcend species line and um, species lines. And so, um, as Simard puts it, below ground, the trees were conversing not only in the language of carbon, but in the language of nitrogen, phosphorus, water, defense signals, hormones, and LLA chemicals, unquote. Um, and the, the, the fact that these different species of trees are communicating with each other, and indeed, across whole kingdoms of life, if we think of uh, trees communicating uh, with um, uh, 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 these underground uh, networks. Um, this precludes kin selection as the um, as as an evolutionary rationale 
for this cooperative behavior because they're not uh, favoring related trees or you know they're not even favoring their own species and so this complicates this idea of kin selection as the sole driver for cooperation um uh, I think a subsidiary reason why there is this sudden interest in uh, the wood wide web and plant communication has to do with the contemporary fascination with networks uh, of, of the kind that uh, the, that you were talking about at the outset, Marco. Um, the German forester Volherben celebrates how fungal net filaments, quote, network an entire forest. Um, the anthropologist Eduardo Cohen talks about rainforests as vast networks of relations, both visible and invisible. Simard speaks of trees benefiting from social networks that improve resilience. A BBC article on, on, on this material uh, is, is entitled, How Plants Talk to Each Other Using an Internet of Fungus. Um, and a fungal specialist, Paul, Paul Stamets, dubs the mycorrhizal networks, quote, unquote, Earth's natural internet, okay? Um, so I think that, that in our age when we are um, so fascinated by clustered communication, social media, crowdsourcing, the hive mind, um, and how many uh, contemporary social movements from Black Lives Matter, Me Too, Idle No More, Extinction Rebellion, Occupy, Hong Kong's umbrella move, uh, movement. Many of these movements are, are largely internet uh, driven and they favor the modular network uh, over, over vertical uh, organizational structures. So I think through all of this, the Wood Wide Web acquires a very contemporary resonance on the biological, cultural, technological, and political fronts. We are only beginning to comprehend the intricate dynamics between networked competition, altruistic self-interest, and collective resilience, all of which are enabled by permeable uh, corridors of being. So the survival of the fittest is not a zero sum game competition within and among species is far more complex than has often been presupposed. As we've seen, one of the markers of so-called forest intelligence is the capacity of fungi, trees, and other forms of vegetation to temper competitive behavior. By redistributing resources, trees and mycorrhizal networks can enhance the collective environment that allows biota to flourish. This raises a profound ontological question. If we envisage the forest as a superorganism, uh, where does the individual tree end and the tangled web of non-tree life begin? By the 1970s, um, neoliberal ideologues of competitive self-interest had found a new ally. They turned to so social sociobiology to reinforce their ranks. Eminent sociobiologists were arguing at the time that the self's ruthless drive to compete is hardwired and therefore irrefutable. Small wonder that free market fundamentalists started invoking sociobiology in an attempt to naturalize and biologize an economic model based on selfishness. If unconstrained capitalism has a genetic rationale, they argued, um, it's pointless to try to replace it with some other system. So we can track the, the powerful tag team of neoliberalism and sociobiology back to the cusp of uh, neoliberalism ascent in the late 70s, within uh, or in, in mid to late 70s, within Anglo-American politics, from which it spread to many other societies and global institutions. The mid seventies saw the publication in quick succession of two socio sociobiology blockbusters, E.O. Wilson's The Selfish Gene, uh, E.O. Wilson's Sociobiology and Richard Dawkins, 
the selfish gene. And at the time, there were a lot of uh, think tanks, particularly in the UK and the US, that were trying to build this link between the new science of sociobiology uh, and neoliberal economics. And all of these uh, helped shape the milieu that saw the rise of Reaganism and Thatcherism. Uh, the contest over the meaning of freedom became critical in all of this. For Karl Polanyi, a core uh, problem of neoliberalism was that, quote, the freedom that regulation creates is denounced as unfreedom. The justice, liberty, and welfare it offers are decried as a camouflage of slavery, unquote. George Monbiot puts the matter bluntly, quote, Complete freedom for billionaires means poverty, insecurity, pollution, and collapsing public services for everyone else. The choice we face is between unfettered capitalism and democracy. You cannot have both, unquote. Now, back in the 1980s, the feminist philosopher Mary Midgley was questioning this reactionary alliance between sociobiology and neoliberalism. Midgley found sociobiology's naturalizing of extreme capitalism as very, very dubious. She dismissed Dawkins' view on evolution as politically motivated. The ideology Dawkins is selling in the selfish gene is the worship of competition. It is projecting a Thatcherite take on economics onto evolution. It's not an impartial scientific view, it's biological Thatcherism. Indeed, Midgley saw the entire field of sociobiology as corrupted by kind of biological Thatcherism. She went on to say, selfish is an odd word because its meaning is almost entirely negative. It does not mean prudent promoting one's own interest. It means not promoting other people's or as the dictionary puts it, devoted to or concerned with one's own advantage to the exclusion or of regard for others. Just as there would be no word for white if everything was white, there could surely be no word for selfish if everyone was always just that. Um, so in other words, she's saying that a tendentious scientific metaphor contributed to a political logic of neoliberalism that help shape the agendas of global economic institutions. And I should say that um, Midgley was not alone in questioning the theory of the selfish gene. Evolutionary biologist David Sloan Wilson had, was another prominent skeptic. Um, and he argued, quote, that the strong form of individual selection itself is a metaphor that creates a misleading picture of nature as selfish, exploitative, and competitive. When he got pushback on his ideas about the selfish gene, um, Richard Dawkins actually caved in a way, and he said he wished he'd not call it the selfish gene, but the cooperative gene. But by that stage, it was too late. <laughs> the horse had left the barn, and there he was remembered by the selfish gene, which became mobilized by many people on the right. Um, so together, the ideological tag team of neoliberalism and sociobiology promoted the idea that the atomistic, competitive, selfish individual has evolved to exist in a state of relentless, self-interested competition. Yet much of the science of selfhood has been pulling in the opposite direction. Charles Otis Whitman has insisted on our quote unquote composite individuality. And as early as the 1970s, Lewis Thomas was arguing, quote, that a good, uh, a, a good case can be made for our non existence as entities. We are shared, rented, occupied. My cells are ecosystems more complex than New York's Jamaica Bay. So this alternative science of selfhood em emphasizes permeability offering alternative pathways to notions of self that are incompatible with the dominant strains of neoliberal thought. Neoliberals thought to remake Homo sapiens as Homo economicus, 
arguing that society is essentially reducible to the economy. But the Human micro Microbiome Project has determined that at a cellular level, any given person is only between 1% and 10% distinctively human. In this view, the self is a shape-shifting gathering place of life forms, some benign, some hostile. The colon, the microbiome of the colon, the body's so-called second brain, depends on a jostling microbial crowd without which it would cease to function. So amidst the ever-changing arrangement of microorganisms and fungi that can help constitute the self, the individual emerges as unavoidably multi-species. In short, it's a biological and ontological error in, to construe the individual and the collective as polar opposites. Uh, in the words of uh, ecologist Douglas Zook, quote, plants were never really plants. They were plant fungal consortia, unquote. Contra the pronouncements of the biological Thatcherites, some of those entanglements surface as self-interest, what I'm calling self-interested altruism. Um, uh, that uh, you can that that life forms collaborate uh, in many instances in ways that both benefit the particular and the community. Um, So I want to close with a section on uh, individual perspectives, tree talk and mutual flourishing. And, and while I was, was, was writing this, I was thinking about a moment in the Monty Python film, The Life of Brian, where Brian, the, the Jesus-like figure, is in a narrow alleyway and he's, he's addressing a crowd of his followers. And he says, uh, Say after me, we are all individuals. And they reply, we are all individuals. And then one hand goes up and he says, I'm not, okay. Um, and it's that kind of dynamic uh, that I'm, I'm trying to speak into today. Four decades after the Reagan-Thatcher uh, neoliberal revolution, billions of people feel stretched thin between hyper-individualism and hyper-globalization disempowered on both fronts. On the one hand, we are caught up in a lonely churn of self-optimization driven by our algorithmic overlords. On the other, we feel overexposed to forces so global that they feel impossible to grasp, far less to transform. To many, the neoliberal insistence on short-term profit and unregulated, unequal growth feels futureless. It has the ring of an ecological death rattle. Many people yearn for something larger than the barricaded self, but smaller than the global marketplace. The climate and COVID crises have both intensified a yearning to repair a threadbare social fabric, which is also always an environmental fabric. And I'm reminded of this remark by Eula Biss in a book on immunity. However we choose to think of the social body, we are each other's environment. And that both in COVID and climate terms, that seems particularly pertinent here. Many people are hungering for empathy, affinity, connection, alliance, for less creative destruction, more palliative care to help offset systemic abandonment by a hollowed out state, many communities have resorted to compensatory networks of mutual aid. And despite the predatory assaults of glo globalized neoliberalism, communal property regimes persist as forms of collective understanding, particularly among indigenous communities. It's in this context that we can read the contemporary attraction of both contemporary cooperative biology and indigenous knowledge systems. Both pretend to pre present personal and group survival differently from how neoliberalism presents them. For despite many divergences, cooperative biology and, and many indigenous epistemologies 
typically underscore the collaborative aspects of resilience. It's both environmental resilience and community resilience. Both knowledge systems embrace interdependence as fundamental to the nature and persistence of life itself. In many indigenous communities, that conviction has endured for millennia, predating not only neoliberalism, but even the long arc of colonialism, of which neoliberalism is a late manifestation. Uh, Robin Kimmerer's work assumes a particular importance here. I talked at the outset about um, her, her uh, recognition of the way in which Potawatomi elders understood that trees could talk in a certain way, that they, they were, were communicating with each other, uh, for example, when the Peccan trees were masting. Uh, Kimmerer's explanation of masting uh, in, in, as in the case of the peccan trees, shares some common ground with Simard's account of the wood wide web. Extensive subterranean networks, what Kimura calls fungal bridges, connecting one tree with another, thereby allowing those trees to mast in concert. Assisted by fungal bridges, the carbon surplus finds expression in a collective outpouring of nuts that Kimura likens to the actions of Robin Hood. They take from the rich and give to the poor so that all the trees arrive at the same carbon surplus at the same time through unity, survival, all flourishing is mutual. Um, so by invoking Robin Hood, Kimmer is suggesting here a larger commitment to redistributive politics to an insistence that the survival of the fittest is a scientifically skewed figure of speech. Uh, Kimura, Simard, Mancuso, and others offer an alternative set of linked metaphors, the wood wide web, fungal bridges, mycorrhizal networks, all dramatize interconnectedness rather than centering agency in a bounded sovereign self. Okay, um, and and while we've been thinking about um, the um, masting of the peccan trees, the synchronized production, maybe think also of something like the murmuration of starlings, uh, which you see in many many, particularly around bridges in in Europe and North America, with these enormous complex patterns of thousands upon thousands of starlings, um, and the the sort of biological argument for that is that they confuse predators like per peregrine falcons uh, the, 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 who struggle to, to target a single bird and that the single birds uh, chances of flourishing are increased by being part of this cooperative collective pattern in the sky. Um, the work of Kimra and many uh, other indigenous thinkers refuses a damaging species exceptionalism that refusal runs deep in many indigenous cultures and long predates the inequities of the neoliberal age. Settler colonial cultures have repeatedly sought to impose on indigenous lifeways a hierarchical world view in which Cartesian dualism and utilitarian economics prevail. From a pervasive colonial perspective, human ingenuity is what grants nature meaning by imbuing dumb matter with economic value. In these terms, inert nature acquires value only when humans convert raw material into commodities. And the commodities then become uh, lively actors by entering the dynamics of the market. But trees are more than timber in waiting. We are lively, they are lively actors shaping Earth's life system. Trees exemplify what biologist Lynn Margulis uh, calls, uh, in, it, it insists it, that um, life is matter that chooses. Life is matter that chooses, unquote. Trees are, moreover, for Kimura and others, our evolutionary seniors and metaphorically our potential guides. Kimmerer's perspective encourages us to rethink evolutionary wisdom 
so as to allow for certain alignments with the finding of, of botanists like uh, uh, and ecologists like Simard and Mancuso. Mancuso, for example, suggests that um, humans exist on a continuum with the acacia, the radish, and the bacterium. Intelligence is a property of life, unquote. Significant differences, of course, exist between indigenous and non-native perspectives. They also exist from one scholar and one First Nation to the next. But indigenous epistemologies and the botany of cooperation do share some common ground, including this. They spurn or reject the idea of Homo sapiens as standing above ecosystems in a posture of earth mastery that vindicates earth plunder. Kimar, Kimara Simard, Mancuso and others reject a supremacist separatist ideology of biotic hubris. These affinities, however, partial remain vital for it is out of such alignments that coalitions for deep change arise. So the interactive forest suggests an alternative path forward to that promulgated by neoliberal think tanks. The reimagined re forest offers a scientifically informed allegory of a more just society in which um, self-interested altruism, that is uh, a form of, of re self-interested redistribution, favors communal survival. And in which long-term collective resilience depends on controlling short-term greed. This ascendant understanding of forest dynamics provides a counter narrative of flourishing, a model of what George Monbiot has called in another context, private sufficiency and public luxury, unquote. The stakes in all this are huge. For as environmental writer Kennedy Warren observes, quote, it is precisely by challenging the philosophical boundary between sentient human and insentient earth that ecological repair becomes possible. Undertaking such repair demands that we reimagine the boundaries of being with a fluid, scientifically informed generosity. That is with a generosity that has long been evident in indigenous cosmologies, but that neither neo neoliberal uh, economists nor biological Thatcherites can entertain. In closing then, let me just say this, it's small wonder that the ideas of self-interested altruism have become a source of public fascination well beyond indigenous communities. Small wonder that in the second and third decades of the 21st century, defenders of the greater public good should be drawn to the science of resilience through sharing. And small wonder that as neoliberalism rips up the social fabric, and rips up the web of life, forest defenders are reaching out to build vital coalitions of repair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Unfortunately, this digital setting does not allow so much the clapping, I guess, but uh, at least I want to join in this way to compliment and thank you for this fantastic speech. I this this is a moment in which I would ask Andreas. Andreas Ross is actually our director. Is uh, helping out us uh, out with the, all the technicalities of Zoom. So maybe Andreas, you can bring uh, Nuno up on the screen because Nuno will help us to organize the Q and A. Hi, Nuno, the Q&A uh, session and also Anya, uh, maybe we can start with some question from the audience here on Zoom and maybe Anya, you can then collect uh, questions from the room, from the from the division, if there is anything uh, and um, there. So Nuno, yes, the floor is yours. Let's see if there are questions for Rob. Yes, so we have two questions here. Uh, we have three. Uh, we'll start with the first one from Abdel Afid Yab Yabri. 
And the question is, don't you think that the other difference between human and plant intelligence is the fact that while humans can be individually and collectively intelligent, trees can only be collectively intelligent uh, through their signal communication. This reinforces the idea of cooperativeness rather than shows the limits of their intelligence. So that's the question. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that is, um, uh, yeah, that's a very important question. The, a tree is not a tree is not a tree. Uh, in other words, we, we, uh, there's been a lot of attention to tree planting as a, a strategy, but if you don't understand the connectivity of trees, if you're just planting individual trees as individual trees, you end up planting a plantation, which is the opposite of a forest, the anti-forest, um, where those uh, interconnected uh, interdependencies are, um, are, are, are neglected and not understood. And so you have a very, very depleted uh, set of trees that are not contributing either to carbon uh, as carbon sinks or to um, biological complexity they don't sustain biological complexity so yes I think that um, there is this difference that uh, trees obviously uh, some some botanists believe that 90 percent of uh, terrestrial uh, trees are connected uh, by these vast uh, mycorrhizal networks and so I think yes there is a, a perhaps a difference in the capacity to function in isolation yeah okay thank you and John Ponsaran then asks what is your commentary to the desperate attempts of neoliberal apologists to reconfigure the socially dysfunctional and morally depraved dominant mode of production has a benevolent system capable of assuming the following camouflage and he quotes capitalism with a heart creative capitalism and capitalism with a conscience mm. yeah okay so a, a lot of that um we you know greenwashing um has been mobilized for instance by the oil majors by big carbon um and so for instance uh, famously in, in britain uh, bp uh, ran a campaign saying uh, what are you doing for the climate today you know trying to individualize actions and um one of the one of the responses on Twitter was I'm boycotting BP um, and so this idea of uh, of capitalism with a conscience of of, of of a benign neoliberalism often deploys uh, the 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 individualized actor um, and 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 while at the same time doubling down on the the structural inequities um, that um prevent a, a, a an inclusive democracy from taking hold yeah thank you so i guess we'll see if someone in the room now in stockholm has any question or yeah i think that i don't know if the room is already no? Okay. it's ready otherwise i can also jump into the discussion well first of all uh, i found very funny the idea of the com the uh, akashe community watch against giraffe i was imagining the situation a dystopic situation generally when i think about community watching i'm thinking about the gated community not so much of the savant so it was really funny thank you rob well i have a a question that is a bit, you know, I am struggling with something. So I understand the beauty of this, you know, cooperation versus competition, no? Mm -hmm. And I I think it's the, you know, the, the power of this uh, epistemologies of ways of seeing the world. But I, I am, maybe I'm now a little bit stretching too much, but what about uh, conflict? 
because I mean, in, in the social world, in the social movements, conflicts is a very important engine for change. You know, we wouldn't be where we are, the little that we are without, you know, social movements, conflicts, revolutions, you can even say struggles. So is it possible that this falling in love for, you know, the connection of plants is also a way for us to overcome the fact that we are uncomfortable with conflicts? And this is maybe a problem because you know to 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 enhance to do something many times you need a lot of cooperation but the cooperation many times is against something else i don't know if i look a little bit too negative and mm -hmm. i might be wrong but i am just you know thinking with you i i i completely see the point and i see the clash between the Thatcherism, Reaganism, and cooperation, but I am also a bit worried about uh, is it also a little bit that we fear conflicts and we cannot even even see conflicts we yeah i stopped yeah no i think that's a really good it's a really good question and um so you know it's not a question of replacing one model with another um there is clearly conflict in uh the biome uh that what we're talking about is reconfiguring a complex duet between cooperation and competition or conflict um and so i mean even darwin at one point when he was registering the the competitive elements what i call self-interest and altruism in uh ecosystems he worried at one point that this might undermine his theory you know um but clearly um, people can advantageously use cooperation or, or life forms can advantageously use that um, to advance their interests. And, um, and as I was saying, there, there is, there is a, a blend of competition or conflict on the one hand and on the other hand, cooperation uh, in, in, in more complex modes than, than uh, were previously understood. Uh, and so, so I, I don't think this, this, I'm not suggesting that the forest is a kind of Shangri-La of uh, tree on tree, a, a tree on tree love fest where the tree huggers are the trees themselves. You know, I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm not um, trying to downplay competition. I'm just trying to integrate uh, this other dimension of life into a, a system that will always be replete with competition and conflict yeah okay so maybe we can go to a couple more questions here from the q a right uh, i think they follow a bit uh one you have a question here from anna Muziol, and she says thank you so much with capital so so thank you so much for your talk today and for resisting the omniscient narration of the market overall. My question is about pedagogy. Do we, especially in the global north, not simply research such non-individualistic ways of being or teaching, or teach, sorry, about literary representations of more communal coexistence, sorry, coexistence, but actually teach the practice, teach rituals of non-competitive empathetic collaboration? Can we even do it, given the neoliberal forms of rewards of individual student progress assessments in our knowledge industry? Mm. No, I think this is a really fascinating question. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Um, so many of us, I can't speak to the situation in KTH, for instance, but um, many of us find ourselves um, embedded environmental humanists or environmental justice scholars in um, institutes or programs that are dominated by scientists. Um, and I've been very fortunate uh, at, at Princeton in finding uh, a community of scientists who are very supportive of the role that uh, humanities can play. At the same time, um, because the sciences tend to dominate um, these these uh, interdisciplinary uh, groups very often the kind of market driven science centric uh, research systems of reward 
and um, denial of reward um, don't apply to the humanities. So I had a colleague, for instance, who applied for a big grant recently, and uh, the reply came back to her saying, um, uh, could you show, if we, if we give you this Princeton grant, could you show how you would use the seed money to leverage bigger grants from elsewhere? And that's an NSF model. You know, it's not a it's not a humanities model. And so that is an example of saying, okay, um, Princeton only has a thirty-eight billion dollar endowment. It needs more money. M money breeds money. And so we just had to say, listen, this is incomprehensible from a humanities point of view. We are looking for your grant from inside the university because there aren't opportunities outside the university. So the financialization um, is is the dominant model with uh, the sciences and with uh, engineering. And we constantly have to protest the eccentricity of our case, which is also an argument for the value of knowledge as opposed to the value of, um, of, 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 of grant accumulation. Um, Yeah, thank you. So I guess now we have some questions in the in Stockholm, right? Yeah, I wish I were there. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you. Great. Okay, so then if anybody has a question, you can raise your hand and uh, we'll take some questions. And uh, even if it's a microphone, you have to speak a bit loud so they hear you. Okay. You can't see me now, but can you hear me, Rob? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. It's, it was really uh, interesting to me. I'm doing research on comments. And um, in that respect, I'm wondering, are we forgetting about the corporate initiatives that are existing um, today? And are they maybe not as present in the, in the culture that we are focusing on? Me personally, I like to focus on trying to understand how ne neoliberalism is affecting subjectivities and structuring our life. Um, but are we forgetting about the, these uh, initiatives and are we really all neoliberal through and through um, competitive self-interested um, beings? And um, the second part of the question is, um, do we have this interest in forest altruism and um, this amazing ability to um, behave um, cooperatively maybe because we are um, I guess in the capitalist core, we are alienated from nature and therefore can establish or this can develop this affection for nature as being something that is romantically, that we can create some love for it because we, as Marcus said, we don't have to deal with the conflicts that it, that cooperation actually entails. Um, so the question is um, a little bit about this romanticizing of um, cooperation, uh, even though I'm doing it to myself, but is, is this a risk? Uh, yeah. And um, are we forgetting about the cooperative initiatives that are already existing? Thank you. Thank you so much. That's, that's uh, a fascinating question. Um, so a lot of my work is in Africa and then in other parts of the global south. And so one of the things that I would say is that Yes, every community has uh, is fracturable and has has um, schisms in it that can be exploited. And when communities are desperate in during a flood or, or in the aftermath of a drought, or when mining has destroyed uh, forests or pasture lands, um, those conflicts are likely to intensify. It's much harder to keep those conflicts keep the community cohesive. Um, at the same time, um, I don't think this, I don't see this kind of thinking as a, a kind of a rich person's luxury. Um, and, and Suzanne Simard, the Canadian ecologist, you know, starts off by recognizing thousands of years of indigenous knowledge along exactly these lines, this idea that um, non-human life is not inert, it doesn't lack agency, it's not subordinate. Um, it's not there to be subjected to human dominion, um, but 
even in what one might call poor societies, there are um, epistemologies, there's ways of, uh, and, and ontologies that assume uh, that one lives in a vital world. I mean, if we think of the, uh, the interest in uh, the rights of nature, which very often is um, connected with, with rivers, for instance, which are very easy to recognize as active, moving, as having agency in the landscape. And so many, many indigenous cosmologies see bodies of water as, um, as, as I said, active creators, co-creators of the world in which these people inhabit. And so I think in those, if I'm understanding your, correction, your question correctly, um, in those cases, it's, it's not a question that this kind of thinking flourishes in the rich world and is irrelevant to poorer societies. I think in many poorer societies, uh, there are um, ideologies of self-interested cooperation um, and the, the cultural forms that negotiate that through the daily interactions with the, the more than human world. Uh, I think we can connect now to one question here by Antonio Ortega Santos, and he asks uh, on the commons and futurity. So he says, does thinking about the relationship and connection between trees, animals, and humans not lead us to a new tool for understanding and projecting the commons into the future as new forms of cooperation in the face of the extractivism of the capitalist model? Is it a way of designing other worlds that are possible? Yes, I think it is. Um, and as with the uh, rights of nature movement, it, it may be at this point less about um, materially embodying those worlds as keeping our imaginative resources wide open uh, so that we are not we're not buying into this idea of the selfish gene of a single rational economic model uh, that is all determining, um, but to respect the immense creativity and variability of life itself. Um, and we are seeing this. I mean, when I taught at the University of Wisconsin, there was a center for the study of rapid evolution. Okay. Um, and so what we're looking at now is how are human and more than human societies uh, trying to adapt and uh, invent new forms of resilience? And what are the old form, what do the older forms of resilience, whether the, we're talking about the cooperative forest or we're talking about uh, indigenous life ways, what can those older ways uh, teach us? about keeping our imaginations open to alternative ways of being. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think there are more questions in Stockholm now. Yeah. Raise your hands. Thank you so much, uh, Rob, for a beautiful presentation. My name is Nina Worms. Um, I felt that it was very hopeful and encouraging. And it's also a way to, to help us think about social movements. And I really enjoyed the way in which you sort of weaved that in. But I wonder if you could help me uh, with the thing that I'm struggling with. <laughs> and that has to do with this um, neoliberal idea of individualizing um, action that is very often criticized. Mm. And I'm wondering, still though, um, I mean, uh, we are, even though we are part of a network, we are still also individual agents. Um, so could you help me think about how to argue in an affluent society like ours, where we do have agency, many of us, <laughs> and we're part of the problem, um, and we have a responsibility, how does one uh, think about those relationships that actually make the change, right? The social movements that you talked about that consist of individuals um, that want to make a difference. This sounds trivial, but I feel that I 
um, I've, been, I've been in a research project where we look at how people sort of argue when they trying to mend the gap that arises when they don't act for climate, uh, mm. like sort of inertia. Um, mm. And there's much to be gained in a force where we can do this together, right? Um, so I'm not sure how to maneuver when um, when I argue, well, we, sh we who, can who were able should mm -hmm. try and m move into social movements. And I get the argument that's a neoliberal thought. <laughs> do you see what I'm, where I'm getting at? So yeah. how can I think about the individual in a constructive way for those who have agency and would like to uh, make change? Right. right. I think that's a really important question. And, and it's a, a question that I deal with constantly or engage constantly with my students around that uh, specific question. So for a time there was, um, in, I think in the more affluent societies, there was a lot of focus on individual actions, uh, change the light bulb and you change the world, you know, that, that sort of thing. And I don't want to disparage that, but people soon come to realize that actually the political structural obstacles meant that you couldn't just have all the well-off people in the world change the light bulbs and flick a switch and the world would be right again, okay? I do think that we need to feel connected to our own agency to be motivated. In other words, so this isn't just an abstract problem of uh, something going on in Egypt that hopefully will change the world, okay? Probably not, but hopefully change the world. So the sense that it's it's remote from my own actions. And so people will make their own choices about um, what transport they use, whether to have children, whether to be uh, vegans, vegetarians, flexitarians, to eat less beef or, or whatever they uh, or um, have... have um, uh, whatever actions that... that seem to align with our own ethics in regard to that but the ethical domain uh, in its in itself is insufficient but when we recognize in others around us people who are eager to make similar gestures and are motivated similarly we do create these nodal communities and and as marco was saying in the beginning uh, there are these networks of of support so both locally and and more broadly you see like-minded people trying to think of ways both to influence the the sort of the, the mega politics, but also to change the way that we live on an individual basis. Uh, and so I think that um, we need both of those. We need the acknowledgement that without the, the large-scale political will, we're not going to get to those targets, those transformational targets. Um, but also that um, in our daily lives, we there's something gratifying about being connected to meaningful action and to being connected to other people who recognize a similar set of life values, if you like. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. We are also following uh, together a little bit the timing. Uh, if you agree, Rob, because I don't want to take too much of your time, we might have still more or less 15 minutes. We can go up to 6.45. Is it okay for you? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So I don't know if uh, maybe we can go to the Q&A on Zoom and then back to Stockholm one last time. Is it okay? Okay, so in the Q&A, just briefly, uh, and these are simple, Olivia Vasquez Medina says this was wonderful, thank you so much. And then we have uh, an, an article on uh, the New York Times, some scientists argue the wood white web theory is overblown. Uh, so this was shared by Enrico Cesaretti. I think they are just more like ongoing comments. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question here on urban planning by Elisa Privitera, and I will read it now. Dear Rob Nixon, thank you so much for your great presentation. I'm an urban planner 
by training and with interest in environmental justice studies and environmental humanities. The question I was wondering is how looking at humans as in continuity with the environment should and can affect the way we live and plan our cities, which is where humans are more concentrated. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, no, I think I, I think absolutely they can. Um, and so the, you know, let, let me start from the United States where there's been a historical problem around um, the national park system and uh, people of color, particularly, um, but more broadly, uh, poorer communities have not had access to that. And so they will often say, you know, in, in Yellowstone or Yosemite or one of the great national parks, um, it's it's easier to it, you're more likely to bump into a, a a Norwegian or a or a or a or a Dane or an Israeli than you are a a Black American. You know, so there's a sense of the the physical remoteness of that world from where people actually live. Um, and I think that in terms of uh, urban environments. Um, one of the things that sometimes happen is that uh, people, particularly people of color in, in the United States, many of them think, well, nature was not designed with us in mind. This is a, this is a kind of a white experience and uh, um, nature is over there. And I think what, what urban planners can do very constructively is work off indigenous, I mean, work off local um ideas about what constitutes nature and what constitutes natural benefits within a particular park within a community garden or, or or things like that in other words nature is not something to that you save up money in order to visit every few years if you're lucky but actually um, is is interspersed in urban life and there's quite there's a very interesting uh, i'm glad you raised this question there's an interesting movement called just green enough which is uh, addresses this particular paradox um that um we know that even in richer countries um poorer communities or poorer neighborhoods suffer from more pollution uh, and uh, so, for instance, the bus depots in New York are mostly concentrated in Black and Latino areas, when more people there get, uh, particularly children, get asthma and so forth. So there's one solution is to plant trees. These are not typically green neighborhoods. But um, I was reading an article recently about by a guy who's, who was protesting the gentrification of Harlem. And these little kids came up on bicycle and they said, what what are you what what's going on here? What are you protesting? And says gentrification. And the one kid, little twelve year old boy, turns to the other kid and said, "Oh, they were planting trees on our, our street, and I knew those trees weren't for us." You know that the association was, "Oh, if they're planting trees, it means other people, those people, are coming to take over our neighborhood." Okay. So how do you walk a line between the physiological benefits of having tree communities in uh, these neighborhoods? and not having the greening of a neighborhood become a kind of a gateway drug for the takeover by richer people or different people, you know? So I think those are the kind of ways in which if we think about both the biotic communities of the trees in the park and we think or in the trees on the street, and we think about the relationship of these communities to the presence of trees, a historical relationship and the contemporary relationship and say to them what do you value about this park what do you see how do you use it and what are the dynamics um, that would uh, both improve the park without taking uh, without risking uh, neighborhood eviction in a sense okay so Nuno, uh, I think that we are approaching. Unfortunately, I, I would love to be here forever, but I, I, I have, I don't have the courage to, to force Rob and everyone else. And so maybe we, we can wrap up. And I guess that we can have another question from the digital audience, and then we go back for the final question from the, from the division. Sorry to 
<laughs> to maybe to interact with the, you know this but is it okay nuno so we can go for one more question from the digital audience and then we move to the kitchen for the last well, yes uh, yeah, i mean yeah. this will be always this will always be unfair and i apologize to people online but uh so this there's a question here that it feels like uh addresses an important issue so sorry for everyone else uh emma e marys she asks fantastic talk and then she says do you have thoughts about using these metaphors of tree altruism to create a productive conversation without falling back into the fallacy that the natural is by definition the good yeah, I think that's an excellent, excellent question. Um, so I, I deliberately use the term self-interested altruism um, so that uh, to try to incorporate some sense of, of a maneuvering self-interest, uh, a subordination of that self-interest circumstantially in order to advance a collective good. But I'm not suggesting that um this is is an is a non-competitive uh, benign environment but rather that um we can liberate ourselves from a narrow view of um full-on absolute non-stop competition uh that we need to uh recognize that even in a competitive environment we see this on reality shows all the time collaboration can improve your chances um uh so i think it's a little it, it, it's I'm, I'm certainly not reaching for an idea of natural purity or that uh these trees are very kindly very kind of lovey-dovey towards each other no they can be viciously competitive and part of that uh, if you want to use the word vicious part of that viciousness can come through uh, uh can, can come via team building in a sense yeah Okay, thank you. And uh, I uh, so there are more couple of questions more in Stockholm uh, to for us to finish the session, right? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> uh, hi, Rob. This is Sir Kirsteline in uh, Stockholm, yeah. uh, and it's uh, very very good to hear your talk. And I learned a lot about. Uh, trees i suppose uh, but also the implications of their collaboration um and of course there it rings a few bells like kropotkin and and, and sort of some repeated uh, uh, kind of flurries of this kind of interesting co cooperation and i'm a bit curious about the structure of your argument you seem to make one empirical observation and that is these books are selling pretty well and they reach out to many people and uh, that is a good sign because it, the kind of implication of that is good, that collaboration is something we should do more about, and I fully agree with that. Uh, at the same time, you seem to suggest that there is a normative uh, way of following up on that and argue that this is the way to go about things even broader politically and so on. Uh, what I'm curious about is how far you can get with that, because at the same time, as these books are selling very well, we see a populist right rising very quickly in Europe and other places, not least in the United States. And, and you see the um, commentary fields in, in uh, or sections in newspapers and so on filling up with cynical arguments. There seems to be more memes out there than the trees, so to speak, yes. and they speak a different language. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how can, can you use your argument in sorting between these various strands will there be anything in your empirical observation that takes you um, anywhere further on the normative front and on the political front so to speak or is this just a way of different camps always competing as they always did or are you making projections about the future yeah thanks that's a very very good question Serka. thanks uh, yeah I think um, you know at one point I talk about how with this pervasive sense of, of widening inequality, growth without distribution has left many uh, populations feeling abandoned. Um, and so as we see from, from, from Italy to the United States, to Bolivia, to Indonesia, to South Africa, uh, so many places, the, 
the response can can veer left or right. There, there's no preordained outcome to that. Um, and what I was trying to flag in this instance was not to say this is a this has universal appeal, but that there is a body, a significant body of people, millions of people. Um, who are drawn to these, these books and these films that explore uh, what are called self-interested altruism uh, as one response to uh, this, uh, the hollowing out of uh, regulations, of um, uh, social support, um, the obligations of the state. Uh, and in that hollowing out, many people feel abandoned and they feel that the system is not working for them. They, then the demagogues and so forth can take over and um, people will have many reasons for to ending up on the right or the left or in the middle. So, it, so I'm, I'm not making a deterministic argument, but I'm making an argument that is trying to uh, unpack why at a particular moment this much of the science has been around a long time uh you know from, uh, from the 80s at least in the 90s but didn't really take off in this way and if i can make a, a slightly analogous argument um you know when when uh, Critson and Sturmer coined the term anthropocene in 2000 uh for a long time it was pretty dormant uh, and that was during the 9-11 era and the era of the war, so-called war on terror, the invasion of Iraq, Afghanistan. There was a certain idea of threat that was, um, I think, inhibited the, the debates around the Anthropocene and the debates around climate change. Then with the, the economic crash of 2008, suddenly inequality was everywhere. Even the right had to talk about inequality. Um, and people felt really crushed and abandoned and um it was in that context that the dominant idea of extreme islamic terrorism and and war and invasions and that was starting to recede in favor of uh these other concerns around economic injustice which took took more center stage and it's, it was at that point that i think um the anthropocene as a trope started engaging people more, uh, more widely uh, and so so you know i'm interested in why particular models of being surface at particular times and do or do not acquire traction but i'm not at all suggesting that that you know uh, attraction is universal um but it's just a um a, a, an attempt to, to bring some historical understanding to the conditions that create in people a hunger, a yearning, a fascination for certain ways of thinking that they may feel are being um, neglected or disparaged uh, in the contemporary environment. Yes, uh, I can go straight to the question. So you, I was wondering, you showed how the um, how the forest altruism uh, became gained traction throughout the last years. So I was wondering whether maybe you have some other topics from ecology and evolution in mind that could gain traction now. Uh, so I, I didn't quite follow that. Could you could you repeat that? Sorry. Do you have other topics from biology, from ecology and evolution that could gain similar uh, traction in popular audience? Us. Yeah. Well, well I, this is interesting. Uh, you know, if we think of the movement for Black Lives and Black Lives Matter, um, how how that went global. But what was even more global was uh, I can't breathe or we can't breathe. Um, that trope, I mean, appeared, we were talking earlier about urban environments, appeared in um, from Cape Town to Lagos to Jakarta to Delhi to Cairo, in many, many cities. It was such a powerful trope. Um, and I, I was thinking of a, a friend of mine who took a photograph of a big uh, graffiti 
on a wall between Cape Town Airport and the city centre, which is the road that all the tourists take. Um, and behind that wall is, are uh, informal settlements. Uh, and so that somebody, this artist had drawn a big car there and said, we can't breathe. And what in that particular place, you've got all the traffic from, from the airport to the city. Um, the, you've got this wall that is used to obscure the unsightly informal settlements and keep um, uh, the poor off, off the motorway. You've also got right behind there, you have a big coal-fired power station. So these people are suffering from asthma and other um, uh, pulmonary diseases. Um, and at the same time, as in many poor communities from Rio de Janeiro to Cape Town, you've got very violent policing of the poor. Okay, so we can't breathe is a is a, a physiological metaphor um, that took off even in places where there were no black people in the world. Uh, you know, um, Black Lives Matter resonated, but we can't breathe if you're living in Delhi uh, air and so forth and you're looking at the forces that are creating this pollution, that would be another example, I think, of, uh, of a meme that really um, met something visceral about the experience of many, many people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. I think that we are now in the unfortunate situation that we must close this fantastic uh, uh, discussion with you. I want to thank you a lot, Rob. I said at the beginning that our lab in Stockholm is what it is precisely for the many connections that we are around the world. And we are very grateful that one of those connections has been leading us to you, Rob to your work, to your thinking. And I am very, very grateful that in this way you are making, you are bringing, uh, leading us towards new uh, ways of thinking about social relations, ecological relation, and the world that we might change. Because if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, Fanon who said that, that sometimes we rebel and we rebel just because we cannot breathe. I am more or less quoting from him, not word by words and so maybe uh, there is this rebellion that is built upon uh, cooperation and different ways of imagining our present our staying together and our future thank you thank you very much and i really apologize to those who didn't have the possibility to ask and especially to get your uh, answer rob but unfortunately we have to close a certain point and i again want to thank all the people who have been helping me out andreas especially who was silent because he was actually beyond uh, you know all the possibility for us to be connected around the world so thank you rob and thank you i hope to see all of you for the 12th archipelago lecture more or less in a year from now but in the middle we will do other things Thank you. Okay. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Okay.